to Beyond. I'm Joan Oriel, president of the Petaluma Museum, and so nice to see you all this afternoon. Uh, very exciting speaker today, and I'm glad everybody, a little tight squeeze, but I'm glad everybody's in okay. Um, there's a lot of special people who really helped pull this exhibition together, and a few of them are obviously in the audience, and we thank them so much for their support, and, and this gentleman who's speaking today has also uh, been just a tremendous asset to this museum and to this, this uh, uh, Beyond exhibition. Uh, we have a very close partnership with Sonoma State University, and I can't think of an exhibit that I've been involved with that Sonoma State hasn't participated in, so we're always so grateful to reach out uh, to the local university, and, and in return, they just provide us with outstanding speakers, and, and it's uh, obviously all free of, free of charge, and, and we're, as a nonprofit, that's, that's something we, we certainly appreciate. So uh, with that, we have Dr. Kevin McClinn, uh, professor at Sonoma State University, uh, also works very closely with NASA, so it should be a fun topic, and the topic today is forget dark matter and dark energy, where did the other 4% come from? <laughs> Dr. McClendon. Thanks. Okay, I should say, I'm, I'm not a professor at Sonoma State. Uh, I work for a NASA program there. There's an education and public outreach group at, at uh, Sonoma State. It's run by Lynn Kaminsky, who is a professor. She's my boss. But um, I work in that group. And uh, I do a number of things, include run a small observatory by, in, on the Pepperwood Preserve, and um, lots of other stuff, which I won't go into. So I hope nobody uh, came hoping to hear about dark matter and dark, dark energy today, because I'm not talking about that. Uh, <laughs> I talked about that about a month ago. You should have been here then. Um, and I didn't want to repeat myself. So this is what we're going to talk about today. And this is the familiar stuff, uh, which, which makes up only 4%, roughly. Uh, the total energy budget of the universe. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about is not this stuff so much per se, because you're mostly familiar with that, but um, the process, I'm going to talk about the process by which we came to understand where this material came from. Um, it's an interesting story, so it's a, it's a sort of a historical talk today. Uh, the first thing that we're going to look at is, is how our understanding of atoms allowed us to figure out the composition of the stars. And then, um, once we understood atoms, and by atoms I mean sort of the, what the electrons are doing. Um, but then, besides the electrons, there are the atomic nuclei. And before we could understand where this material came from, we had to understand the atomic nuclei. So it's a two-part talk. Uh, it probably should really be two talks. But they, didn't, they wouldn't give you two talks. Um, <laughs> So, I'm going to start off with this, this little quote, which is amusing. Um, it says, on the subject of the stars, all investigations which are not ultimately reducible to simple visual observations are necessarily denied to us. Which means all we can know is, is their motion in the sky. We can time when they rise and set and transit and things like that. We shall never be able by any means to study their chemical composition or their mineralogical structure we shall not at all be able to determine their chemical composition or even their density. I regard any notion concerning the true mean temperature of the various stars as forever denied to us. This was by a philosopher, Auguste Comte. In uh, 1835, he made this statement, and um, it was wrong. <laughs> but, you know, you can forgive him a little bit. Stars are really far away. All, all we see are points of light except for the sun. Uh, in 1835, we didn't really know the sun was a star. There was the sun, and then there were all these points of light, the stars. Um, they were very, it was known they were very far away. And so it was a perfectly reasonable thing for him to have said, but it should be a cautionary tale because it was nonetheless wrong, despite being very reasonable. Uh, so this first part of the talk, I'm going to go over how our understanding of atoms made Auguste Comte wrong. This is a spectrum. It's a spectrum of the sun. And um, you've probably seen a spectrum like this when you've seen a rainbow. <coughs> or if you've seen sunlight pass through a prism, you are familiar with, with that rainbow. I mean, that's where the, where the word comes from. Um, but if you, if you look more closely, you'll see this continuous pattern of red to blue is, is broken up by these dark lines. And um, those are called Fraunhofer lines. After the, after the person who first noted them and studied them, there are these two really big, bright ones right here in the middle. Does anybody know what those are? Oh, good. Ah, <laughs> oh, somebody does, okay. 
So some of you might be bored with this talk, hopefully not. But um, <clears throat> yeah, those are sodium. Uh, the, the, the lights that we use at night, those yellow lights, mm -hmm. it's because they're emitting these two lines. Okay, that's, that's what so that yellow... Is there emitting what? These two, these, two light, these two colors. This is an absorption spectrum. So this is, this is the sun absorbing, not known to Fraunhofer, known to us. Um, but you can also make gases emit as well as absorb. And so in those, in those lamps, the sodium is emitting those colors. And that's why they're, they're orange. Um, this is sort of like the apparatus that Fraunhofer would have used. And some of you may have used a similar thing in your high school or chemistry science classes when you were doing spectroscopic analysis. I always saw those in my classes, but we never actually used them for anything. But they were sitting over there in the corner. Uh, basically, you have a small telescope, and you look through the telescope at light that has been passed through a prism, and it has passed through the prism from, say, a source. Over here, you would have a, uh, an opaque disk with a slit in it, and the light would pass through the slit. In this case, the source is some kind of a, a lamp. Um, a flame. And, and so the light, when it passes through the prism, gets split up just like well, the background here or the, the previous picture, and, uh, and you see that rainbow. But if you use this telescope, and the telescope swivels around on a little pivot so you can change what color you're looking at, what wavelength you're looking at, then you can map out where the dark lines are. So this is what a spectroscope does. And um, if you're clever, and people work, you would put some object over here and you would pass the light from that object through the prism as well, and you would look at both spectra simultaneously, and so you could compare the sample you were studying, you were interested in studying, to something that you already knew what it was, and compare where the lines were, and therefore measure um, the position of the new lines. Now, Fraunhofer didn't know all that. All Fraunhofer knew is that when he looked at, he was, a, he was an optician, he was an optician in Bavaria, um, he made lenses, and he just noticed these rainbows that everybody had noticed for thousands of years and got curious about them. So he began to study them. And, it, and he finally um, put the sun through a spectroscope like I showed you. And this is what he saw. So this is his hand-drawn uh, depiction of the sun's spectrum of absorption lines. And he labeled them with, with letters. This is how you could tell he was a true scientist. Um, because we're always very inventive. We label things with either letters or numbers. Um, sometimes we use Greek letters if we're really, really <laughs> feeling our oats. Um, he had no idea what he was looking at, though. Um, and as I showed you, he did notice that these two, uh, there were these two very, very strong lines that were in the same part of the spectrum as sodium. He didn't know it was sodium, he just knew it was lamps in his lab. It, it is sodium, we know, but he didn't know that. Uh, but there's a lot of sodium around, so those, you often see those lines in, in just a fire that you would make. Um, the other thing that Fraunhofer did is he discovered that the moon and the planets show the same pattern of lines as the sun. And so he demonstrated that the moon and the planets do not shine by their own light. That was debated up to that point. But they're just reflecting sunlight. Okay, so you can do this, even if you don't know what the lines are. You can, you can deduce these sorts of things. Um, he pointed his spectroscope at some of the brighter stars. He noticed they too have dark patterns of lines, but they're different from the ones that you see in the sun. And then he died. Um, he died at the age of 39 of tuberculosis. And so he was not able to continue this. So um, this was 1814 um, when he was doing his work. And in order to continue the work, we have to skip ahead about three decades when some other scientists took it up. And also, they were German scientists, not Bavarian in this case. They were in Heidelberg. Uh, and, and these people, well, certainly one of them, you've heard the name. Um, this is Robert Bunsen over here, Bunsen burner. Everybody who's ever had chemistry you know, knows about that. So he invented that. And, and they used the Bunsen burner to make the flames that they, that they looked at. Um, his, his colleague here, Kirchhoff, is a famous physicist. But he's, he's only famous to physicists. You might not have heard his name before. Uh, but he's, he's well known for uh, studying the properties of light and its transmission. Um, <clears throat> so what they did is uh, they, they used a Bunsen burner to make a flame, and then they would put salts of metal, say, into the flame. And you, you may have done that in chemistry. I remember doing that in chemistry. You get a little wire, and you, you 
dip it in some salt and you'd put it in the flame and then you'd see these brilliant colors and it's kind of cool. It's how you make fireworks, right? Um, but they did more than, than that. They didn't just look at the colors, they put a spectroscope on it and they measured the lines. The colors that you see are, are your eye mixing up a bunch of emission lines from the gases. And, this is, and they discovered this. So here are some examples of different gases. Um, I don't know offhand which any of these are except this one. This one I know. Anybody else know this one? Hydrogen. Sorry? The hydrogen. Hydrogen, yeah. And we, we can figure out who the real geeks are in the class because they can, <laughs> um, not the class, but in the room, because they can, they can measure the, uh, or they, they know the spectral patterns. This is hydrogen. This is the simplest one. Um, and you might guess that anyway, just as the fewest lines, right? It's the simplest atom. Um, they also just, as an aside, they discovered cesium and rubidium this way. They weren't known before. They were discovered through their spectra um, in the laboratory. Now, one thing that Kirchhoff did, and this is quite clever, um, it's, it's one thing to, to put samples of materials into a flame, heat them up, and see the emission lines. But the other thing he, he did was he got cool gases and he put them in front of a glowing object. Now just an opaque glowing object will, will create what's called a continuum. It looks like a rainbow. The sun is an opaque glowing object and it creates a continuum just because it's hot. We all do the same thing except our continuum is peaking in the infrared. And since we don't see infrared light, we don't see ourselves this way. A rattlesnake sitting in the corner of the room does detect infrared and would see us all glowing. Okay, and, and I think cats also see someone at the infrared. There's certain animals that do, but we don't. And of course we can have technology. We can make infrared cameras and then we'd all be glowing. Um, so what, what Kirchhoff did is he would place a tube of cool gas in front of his light source and then he would measure the spectrum, this spectrum, and then he saw the dark lines, just like you see in the sun, just like the Fraunhofer lines of the sun. And he realized that some of these lines corresponded exactly to the wavelengths of the lines that you see in the Fraunhofer spectrum of the sun. And so he was able to deduce what elements are in the sun. So August Comte should have lived 30 more years. And he could have eaten crow or, or whatever. Um, so what he realized then is that these lines are actually made by the absorption of the light that's, that's produced in the very hot lower layers of the sun in the cooler outer layers of the sun. That's why we're seeing this spectrum, both in the sun and in other stars. We still don't know where the lines are coming from. No idea. This is, you know, about 1860. Nobody knows that there are atoms. Nobody knows that there are electrons. Certainly nobody knows that there are nuclei. Nobody has a clue. So all we're doing is is seeing patterns in nature and matching them up. Um, so they showed a couple of things. They showed the sun is composed of gas. People didn't know what the sun was before that. Now we know it's a gas. It certainly behaves like these gases in the lab. We know what materials are in the sun, at least some of them. And so here's a list of some of the uh, atoms that they detected. Sodium, magnesium, chromium, calcium, barium, zinc, copper, nickel, iron. Almost all the lines you see in the Fraunhofer spectrum are iron lines. Does anybody want to note something that's, does anybody find that list surprising in any way? Knowing what we know now? Somebody's starting to say it. There's no hydrogen. There's no hydrogen. And from our vestige here in the uh, 21st century, we know that the sun is mostly hydrogen, but it's not there. Okay? It's not there at all. Um, he also looked at the spectra of, of other stars and uh, Fraunhofer and looked at the spectra of other stars, as I mentioned. And so other astronomers began to do this, and they started using these techniques to measure um, those spectra, and they, they discovered what the, what the composition, at least partially, of the other stars were as well. So um, this was sort of the beginning of the field of astrophysics. Prior to this, astronomers were mostly concerned with the motions of things in the sky, and, and, and usually it was a big clock. The sky's a big clock, right? And, and so observatories were concerning themselves with telling the time of day <laughs> or telling latitude and longitude used for navigation that kind of thing. Um, this switches astronomy into the field of astrophysics, which it basically is now. There are still some people doing uh, the old type of astronomy, but not, not very many. 
And I should mention that that led to lots of things like understanding the, the composition and evolution of the stars, distribution of galaxies, the universe is expanding, blah, 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 blah. Right? The whole, the whole field of, that we think of as astrophysics is starts right here. Does it relate to biological evolution or evolution of the stars? Evolution of the stars. Yeah. I'm not a biologist. I don't, I don't talk about biology. That's, yeah. I took one semester of biology in my whole life. Maybe it was a freshman year of high school. Um, <clears throat> physics is beautiful, right? You just have, I mean, you get your, your fingertips dirty with chalk dust. You don't have to mess with chemicals. And <laughs> um, all right, so, <clears throat> so here's the periodic table again. And I've, I've highlighted the elements that were detected in the sun by, by Bunsen and Kirchhoff. Uh, note all the ones that were not detected. And furthermore, I should say that this periodic table of the, of the elements, which we're all very familiar with, um, was not even invented yet when they did their work. So they didn't even know how much they were missing, right? Uh, well, I just, it, the, the other elements were known, but their, but their systematic chemical um, properties were not, were not well known. Um, all right. Now. I've already mentioned they had no idea what they were looking at. They had no idea where these lights were coming from. And in order to understand that, we have to go forward um, several more decades, and we have to get a new worldview. And that, these two were, were very much classical physicists, classical scientists. Um, and in order to understand both the periodic table and the spectrum of lines, you have to have a, a quantum physics worldview. And that wasn't invented yet, not for another four decades at the earliest, but really, six decades or so. Um, so this slide is just going to very quickly go over some of the things that, that had to happen before you could understand the stars. Uh, in 1900, Max Planck came up with the first quantum theory of anything. And I'm discounting quantum theory of matter. There's, a, there's an atomic theory that goes way back to the Greeks even, and, and a physically based atomic theory that goes back to the beginning of the 19th century. So I'm not talking about quantized matter and atoms. I'm talking about quantized physical quantities like, say, energies. Um, Max Planck came up with a quantum theory of, uh, to explain black body radiation. So these are curves of the spectrum. So this is the sun spectrum. I showed you uh, the rainbow before, and it's just, um, it goes from blue, this would be blue on this end, to longer wavelengths, red. and it, the intensity grows and then decreases, so there's a peak, and it looks something like a skewed bell curve. Um, and it's called black body radiation. I pulled this off the web, and it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. It's backwards. Does anybody know why it's backwards? Well, this one, which peaks at the, this is blue over at this end. This one, which peaks at the bluest wavelengths, is actually from the hottest object. And this one, which peaks at the longest wavelength, is actually from the coolest object. And cool objects are red, and hot objects are blue. So they've exactly reversed uh, the sense that the curve should have. I don't know why they did that. Uh, but it makes a nice little, little uh, point to bring up. Uh, but all objects, as I said, even us, emit these types of curves, this thermal radiation. And um, it led to a problem in physics in the, into the 19th century. Basically, classical physics, if you, if you look at how the spectrum works and you try and predict how these curves should be shaped, they predict, it predicts that there should be an infinite amount of energy emitted at short, at short wavelengths. And I won't go into why that is. Um, this has to do with the statistical mechanics. And, uh, but clearly, they don't, they don't do that. They drop off. And so Planck was looking at this and trying to understand it. And pretty much out of desperation, um, he made an assumption. And the way that classical physics describes elect electromagnetic radiation being produced is you have a charge oscillating. Accelerated charges always emit light, electromagnetic radiation. So if you have an oscillator, like a charge on a spring, going back and forth with some frequency, it will emit radiation of that frequency. And the way you produce all these frequencies is you imagine a whole bunch of charges on springs oscillating at different frequencies. And there should be a continuum, because there's a continuum of, of energies that are depicted here. And nobody could make it work. So what Planck did is he said, well, there isn't a continuum. 
Instead, the energies of those oscillators come in little steps. They're quantized. And when you do that, your integral over the energies at, at high frequency goes to a sum, for those of you who care about mathematics. Um, and that makes the curve turn over, and it exactly predicts these curves. Exactly. Um, Planck never really liked that. It was a mathematical desperation move. Um, and a lot of people didn't like it. They didn't know what to make of it. They thought it was just a mathematical trick. They didn't believe that it said anything about the universe. Keep that in mind. Um, in 1900, Albert Einstein presents quantum theories for the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect is um, it's how certain like photonic switches work. If you shine light on them and then the light goes on, you know, you can, you can control electronics this way. So if you shine light on certain materials, they begin to emit a current. But it works in a funny way. Uh, you have to have a high enough energy of light, so blue enough light. Red light won't do it. Furthermore, any amount of red light you use will not do it. You would think, well, if it's just a matter of energy, if I shine a lot of red light, that's the same as shining a little bit of blue light, so it should work, but it doesn't. And this was a puzzle, too. And so what Albert Einstein said in 1905, one of the three amazing papers he wrote that year, was that, well, light comes in little bundles. Light energy is quantized. And you have to have sufficient energy in the little bundles in order to activate, in order to excite the charge. And then it will conduct. That's what he won a Nobel Prize for. He also um, came up with Brownian motion, which was sort of another quantum theory that he explained as jiggling of small um, particles suspended in a fluid by saying that the fluid's made of a lot of atoms that are bumping into it and causing it to jiggle, which is correct. Um, and he also had his paper on special relativity equals mc squared, etc. Although not in that particular paper, that took till 1907. But, um, but the beginnings of that came out this year, 1905. So, so here's Planck's expression for the energy of the oscillators, h bar omega, h is called Planck's constant. It's just a constant of nature. Omega is the frequency. And how many times a second does it go back and forth? And here's Einstein's expression for the energy of a photon, h nu. Nu and omega are the same. It's just that omega is divided by 2 pi. And h and h bar are the same. It's just that, um, sorry, not divided by 2 pi. It's times 2 pi. Um, h bar and h are the same. It's just that h bar is divided by 2 pi. So those are really the same thing. Um, just a factor of two pi, it get can it gets canceled out. <clears throat> so here, here are Planck's oscillators, and here's Einstein's photons, and they just look remarkably the same. Um, then in 1911, Rutherford, who was a Canadian um, physicist who went to work in Cambridge when he got famous, uh, but he, I think he was still in that. Uh, this is what made him famous. So. Um, he was probably still in Canada. He was at McGill <coughs> University. He, um, he fired alpha particles at a target. Um, and I forget what the target was, lead or gold or something. And he found that some of the alpha particles bounced straight back. Some of them went off in weird angles, but some bounced straight back. And what that told him was that atoms had to be quite dense and heavy because alpha particles were known to be quite dense and heavy. Alpha particles, we'll find out, are made of two protons and two neutrons, which Rutherford didn't know. He didn't know what they were, but he knew they were dense and heavy. You could, you could determine that already. Um, and so if you think about, think about riding your bicycle into a semi that's parked on the side of the road. You're going to bounce right off the semi. You're going to go straight back the way you came from. Because you, compared to the semi, are very, very light. Um, that's what the alpha particles do. Now, if you rode your bicycle into a, a big pile of cotton candy, even if it was the same mass as the semi, you would go through and you would slow down, get bogged down, and finally you'd come to a stop. But you wouldn't just bounce straight back. Um, so that means that atoms, at least in part, are more like a semi than cotton candy. And there were two competing, well, there was one big model of the atom was due to a physicist named J.J. Thompson, who was at Cambridge. And he thought that the atom, he discovered the electron. J.J. Thompson discovered the electron. And he thought the atom was made of this sort of positive fluid of some sort with electrons moving around inside of it. 
but there was but the mass was kind of spread out throughout the whole volume of the atom. So that's more like the cotton candy model. Rutherford showed that was wrong. He showed that, in fact, the atom has this dense positive nucleus, and that's what the alpha particles are bouncing off of. The volume of the atom is quite large, that's, that is where the electrons are, but they're just far away from the nucleus a lot of the time. So the atom has a whole lot of volume with all the mass concentrated in the center. It looks a bit like this. It looks a bit like a little solar system. Keep that in mind, solar system. That's one of the great misconceptions people have about atoms. They don't look like solar systems, but we'll pretend for the moment that they do. <coughs> Then in 1913, Niels Bohr, who was a Danish physicist, developed a theory of the hydrogen atom that was based on quantizing the angular momentum. Um, there's a problem with Bohr's theory of the atom, which became obvious to anybody instantly. Remember I said a little while ago that if you accelerate charged particles, they radiate? Well, if electrons are moving around the nucleus the way that planets are moving around the sun, they must be accelerating. There's a centripetal acceleration that's keeping them in orbit. Just like there's an acceleration of gravity keeping the Earth in orbit around the Sun. So they should be radiating. And you can calculate from their uh, speeds how much they should radiate. And they should radiate all their energy in a fraction of a second. The atom should collapse and there should be no atoms, there should be no chemistry, and I shouldn't be giving this lecture. <laughs> but they clearly are there. So Bohr, um, again, oops, didn't press that yet. Um, oh, I guess that's just there all the time. So Bohr, again, sort of out of a maybe not quite desperation like Planck, but, but sort of a wild guess. He said, well, let's, um, let's just state that there are only certain energies that the, atom, that the electron can have in the atom. There's a lowest state, which is called the ground state, and those energies, those orbitals, are determined by um, the atom ha having a quantized angular momentum. Turns out not to be quite right, but, um, but it's, it's in the right direction. And it does a remarkable thing. So I'm going to go into it in a little bit of detail. I'm not going to actually go through all this math, but I am going to explain it. So by, by quantizing the angular momentum, angular momentum, P is usually momentum in physics, and angular momentum is R times P. So, so my momentum is just my mass times my velocity moving through space. And if I have some distance from you, then you can do R times P, and I'm simplifying this a little bit. So I have some angular momentum around you. And that's because, as you watch me go by, you see my angle, my, the, the direction to me change. So I have some angular momentum, even though I'm moving in a straight line. So people sometimes think angular momentum has to do just with spin. Well, spinning things do have angular momentum, but it's not necessary to spin to have angular momentum. Right? So her, she would see me at some angle, she would see me at some angle. I would, all, I would have angular momentum relative to all of them. But if I walk straight at somebody, there's no angular momentum. My direction's not changing. Right, so there's more than just R. There's some geometrical term that I'm leaving out. But that, that kind of makes sense, what angular momentum is. And so what, what um, Bohr is saying is that this quantity, angular momentum, comes in units of h bar. Here's Planck's constant again. It has units of angular momentum, by the way. I didn't tell you what the units were. It has units of angular momentum, which are momentum times distance. And times n, where n is an integer. So if you do that, you can um, say, well, what does that imply for the energy? And you can write down an equation for the total energy, kinetic plus potential. And if you have had high school physics, you could do this math. Because that's all there is. This, this is the only part that is tricky, and it's just a guess. Um, and when you do, you find out that the energies that are allowed are a constant energy called the Rydberg energy divided by n squared, where this is n, and it's negative because atoms are bound, so they have negative energy, they're, they're attractive. Um, and this Rydberg energy is, is related to what's called the Rydberg constant. It's a whole bunch of physical constants, and these just come out of the math when you do the problem. It's four lines of algebra to do this. Um, this is the Rydberg constant. It comes from the Rydberg formula. Rydberg was a Swedish physicist who was studying the relationships between the lines in hydrogen. And he found that there's just this empirical relation. There's this constant, and then each wavelength that you see is related to other wavelengths by 1 over some integer squared. Turns out this end and this end are the same thing, but Rydberg didn't know that because he did his work in 1888. 
He didn't even know what atoms were. He was just, again, doing an empirical study of this is what, this is what um, the, the, the lines are that I see. So let me just, I just want to belabor this a little bit. So Bohr was able to reproduce this empirical formula by making this really simplistic assumption. It only works for hydrogen, but it does work for hydrogen. And um, it clearly told us something, or I wouldn't be belaboring it. it was, even though it was wrong, it told us something. It told us that energy levels in atoms are quantized, and that um, there's something related to angular momentum that, that's doing it, probably. So this was 1913 that Bohr did this. And scientists puzzle over this, and it, it doesn't work for other atoms. But that, that very idea is enough for some of them to start thinking of other atoms in these terms, in these quantized energy levels. And so this, this, this guy, Meghna Saha, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, um, he deserves to be more famous than he is. He's, he's well-known to astronomers. But who's ever heard of Saha? Good. I'm glad. Somebody heard of him. Um, he was uh, an expert in, in statistical mechanics, statistical physics and thermodynamics. And so he used his, his knowledge of, of those fields and this idea of quantized energy levels in atoms to describe what was going on in stars to give you the spectra. And I'm just going to read you this quote here from his paper on this. It says, the varying records of different elements in the Fraunhofer spectrum may be regarded as arising from the varying response of these elements with regard to the stimulus existing in the sun. Owing to the different internal structure, elements will respond in varying degrees to this, the sun's stimulus. Um, so he's thinking the sun is this big ball of gas. It has a temperature, a pressure, and a density. And those three things will affect the atoms in it according to their internal structure. And he didn't just say that. That's paraphrasing this equation that he derived. So this is a theory that he de developed. It's called the Shaw equation. And I'm going to go through this just a little bit. So if you have an atom, let's say you have hydrogen, you can have neutral hydrogen where the electron is still connected. And that would be Ni, say, the number of hydrogens per cubic centimeter that are neutral. Then you can ionize the hydrogen so the electron and the proton are separated. That would be Ni plus 1. That's one ionization state higher than whatever's down here. This doesn't have to be neutral. But it's relating, for a given atom, the number of ionized species that are one ionization level higher than this thing in the denominator. This is the number of electrons per cubic centimeter. So he's saying that the number of ionized species, the ratio of the plus 1 to the, the next lower level, times the number of electrons is equal to basically a whole bunch of stuff that has to do with the temperature and some thermodynamic terms that aren't important. So the temperature is affecting the ionization of atoms in a particular way that this equation predicts. And this is just the ionization energy. It's the amount of energy it takes to ionize to the next state. For hydrogen, that's 13.6 electron volts to ionize hydrogen. But for other atoms, you have different ionization energies. And so what he showed was that um, when you look at the sun and you see these lines, it's not necessarily the case that you're going to see the lines of all the possible elements there are. Because the temperature of the sun and its density may make some of them invisible. For instance, some of them may be ionized, and you won't see them. They're ionized away. So you might not see calcium ions because, or calcium atoms because there may be calcium ions. And that has a different spectrum. Does everybody follow me on that? Clearly. <laughs> I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of complication here, but the important thing is he's saying that the sun's temperature will affect the electronic state of the atoms in such a way that you may not see neutral atoms. You may have to look for ionized species. And nobody had thought of this before. Okay, this was 1920. Now, in the meantime, um, 
since about the about 1870 or so, some astronomers had been hard at work trying to classify the spectrum of stars. And this was done at the Harvard College Observatory, and it was done exclusively by women. The director of the Harvard College Observatory was not a woman, was, was a man, figuring. But um, all, the, all his underlings were women, and they were called computers, because they did computations. Um, this woman, Annie Cannon, came up with the spectral classification of star system that we still use, and this kind of shows it. Hot stars are called O. Um, they have a few lines, these are the lines of hydrogen, um, that are strong. As you go to cooler stars, B and A, this, the lines of hydrogen become stronger. Um, and then F stars, they start to disappear. By G, they're pretty much gone. The sun is a G star. But notice these other darker lines, not very bright up here, or not, I should say not very prominent, but they're getting more and more prominent as we go down. And these are very cool stars, M stars. These are the red stars that we see in the sky, Betelgeuse, Arcturus, stars like that, if you know what those stars are. And you get these, these very large absorption bands. Now, Annie Cannon simply looked at patterns. She was really good at seeing patterns like this. She could just use her, her little magnifier, look at them, and tell you what kind of star that was. Um, and she didn't really care to go any farther than that. Antonia Mallory was a successor to her. I mean, so when she came to work at the observatory, Annie Cannon was quite, was quite old. Um, and Cecilia Payne also was a successor to her, and we'll talk more about her. Um, and Pickering, the, the head of the observatory, assigned each of these two women to um, classify a whole bunch of stars, she in the southern hemisphere and she in the northern hemisphere. So they have to split up the sky, go classify stars. Now, <clears throat> Cecilia Payne was different. She wasn't happy the way that Annie Cannon and, 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 and um, Antonia Mallory were simply to classify them and go, okay, done. She wanted to actually understand it, and she's an interesting person. Um, she was British, and she was born in 1900, and she was middle class British. Um, she was able to go to school at Cambridge on a scholarship because she was very smart. She's brilliant, in fact. And she got her degree. She studied physics and astronomy. She got her, her degree, went a bachelor's, I guess. And she wanted to go on, but she couldn't. Why not? Because she was a woman. Because she was a woman. Um, so what was open to her? What jobs could she do in, say, 19, 20 or so with, a degree, with, with degrees in physics and, and astronomy? Teach. She could teach. She could be a teacher, right? Which is pretty much what any woman with a college degree could do. She could be a teacher. And she really didn't want to do that. She did not want to do that. Um, but while she was a student, uh, an American astronomer named Harlow Shapley, who you may have heard his name before, um, came through and uh, was impressed with her. And so invited her to go study at Harvard. He had since become the director. It was actually not Pickering who assigned him. It was Shapley who assigned him to, to study the Northern and Southern Stars. Chaplin had become the, the director of Harvard College Observatory when Pickering retired. Um, so she went, she went to Harvard as, sort of as a, as a guest scholar, but then she got hired on as a computer and started doing the spectra. But unlike the other women, she was not content just to, just to classify things. She wanted to understand them. So she took the ideas of Shaha and others and applied them to, to the spectra of the sun. And she found out that the stars are mostly composed of hydrogen. If you run all these spectra, all the strengths of these lines, look at the strengths of the lines, which tells you the, the number of atoms of different ionization states. You find out that the sun's mostly composed of hydrogen by about a factor of a million more than the next most abundant element. Or sorry, I should not say that. Than the, the heavy elements you see. The next most abundant element is helium. It's down by about a factor of 10 from hydrogen. Um, so hydrogen and helium make up essentially everything, everything else. Remember all those dark lines and there were all these metals like iron and chromium? Those are less than a tenth of a percent of the composition of the sun. But because of the temperature and pressure conditions in the sun, they happen to have a lot of lines that are visible in the, in the visible part of the spectrum. That's why the Fraunhofer lines are full of them, not because that's what the sun is made of. Okay, the sun contains those things. But you have to do more. It's not just as simple as, as seeing it. So she's quite an amazing person. Um, 
And she, um, she doesn't get much mention, so, so I'm going to mention her. They gave, <coughs> they gave her a PhD. The other women that I mentioned, none of them had PhDs. None of them could get PhDs. They should have. They did this fundamental work in astrophysics. Any man doing that would have had, had a PhD. Now, Pickering was quite smart hiring these really smart women to do this work. He could hire them cheaply, and they were really good. Um, but Shapley wanted to give her a PhD for doing, for doing this work. And so um, he went to the physics department and said, give her a PhD. And the head of the physics department, his name was Lyman, um, famous physicist, the Lyman series is named after him, said, no, we don't give women PhDs at Harvard. So Shapley was able to convince the president to form a new department, the astronomy department. And Cecilia Payne received the first PhD in astronomy from Harvard that was ever given. Wow. Um, she also went on to become, finally, in around 1950, a professor, but it took that much longer, 25 years, and to be the chair of the department, which she remained for quite a long time. She died in 1977. Okay. Um, and I didn't know any of this, I just got fascinated by her because you're always told as a student that her PhD thesis was the most brilliant astrophysics PhD thesis ever written in the history of astrophysics. And she showed that someone's made a hydrogen. Oh, okay, let's find out more about it. And that's all you hear. And she went on to study things like um, variable stars. That's what she was really interested in, and that's what the rest of her career was. So, I, you know, she was quite a remarkable woman. She's written a, she wrote a, an autobiography, which I read. And it, I recommend it. It's interesting because you know she was a, a young Victorian woman basically growing up in England, and has that sensibility. And she makes and, and she came from England to the United States in the 1920s, and has interesting things to say about the United States and her colleagues uh, and, and science and the role of women from that perspective. And because she was very well brought up, she's always very proper about it. And even if somebody is not to her liking or something is not to her liking, she lets you know it. But in the most polite way, right? The way only the British can do. So um, it's a, I highly recommend it if you're interested in following this stuff up. And I just as a little side, quantum mechanics, the full theory was not even published until 1927, and she published her thesis in 1925. So in 1927, the Schrodinger equation was published, and that actually gets most of what's going on in Adams correct, almost. So that's Adams. That's how we know that the sun is made of hydrogen. Now, she didn't believe that herself. Um, and nobody else really believed it either. In fact, a very prominent astronomer, Henry Norris Russell, sort of convinced her, you should really take that line out of your thesis because it's probably wrong. <laughs> and so she didn't publish it very much. I mean, she was never about tooting her own horn. Um, and only in the next five, four or five years did people come to realize that she was right. And Norris, to his credit, he published his paper saying, yeah, this is correct. He gave her credit for it. Um, he published a paper, but he said, this is, you know, she said this in her thesis, and she, she got it first. Um, so, anyway. So the next step, now that you know the sun is made of hydrogen, if you want to know how it works, is you have to understand how, how nuclei work. And this is the path that leads to that. Um, solar power, not the kind of solar power that we're talking about in the Mojave Desert, but what's actually making this thing glow? Um, and there are two possibilities here. I mean, I'm not going to go to the ancient ideas about a big, you know, fire, burning coal or wood or something. Um, com those would be combustion. Um, so there's combustion and there's gravity. Those are based on the two forces that were known in the 19th century. Combustion is just electric, it's chemical, it's electrochemical, burning things, oxidizing them. Um, and then gravity is, you know, when you drop things, they release energy, so if the sun was contracting, it could release energy. Neither of these works, however. So going through this real quickly, you basically would say that the time the sun can last is the ratio of how much fuel it has, which is related to its mass in some way, divided by how much energy it's emitting, called its luminosity, which we call it L. So um, this is just sort of like if you have 10 gallons of gas and you're burning a gallon a minute, how long is your car going to last before you run out of gas? Right? That's, that's all this is doing. Um, and we're not saying the sun is converting mass into energy. We're just saying that the amount of energy that it has at its disposal is related to its mass. If it were bigger, it would have more energy. 
So for combustion, if you burn something, for every gram you burn, you get a certain amount of energy out. And it depends what you're burning, and, you know, but we're doing hand wavy, back of the envelope type of calculations here. We just want to see if we can explain sort of how the sun works. So um, if you put in a number that's sort of appropriate for combustion, even if you have the most efficient combustion you can imagine, um, this time scale is about 1,000 years. That's how long the sun could continue to burn as brightly as it does if it was simply burning stuff the way, you know, you burn a match. Well, the Earth is older than that, I think. Um, been to places on it that, you know, go back more than a thousand years. Everybody knew that was wrong. That doesn't work. The other way you can do it is gravity. So the gravitational energy um, from Isaac Newton, Newton's law of gravity, is its mass squared divided by its size, r, times Newton's constant g, gm squared over r. That's how much energy is in the sun gravitationally. So if the sun could slowly contract and convert that gravitational energy into radiation, then maybe it could shine for a long time. And um, if you do that calculation, which was done by um, Kelvin and Helmholtz, you get about 10 to the 7 years. That's better. Um, 10 million years. That might even sound reasonable, except that around this time, people are beginning to understand that the Earth is billions of years old. It's not from radioactive dating yet. That was Marie Curie's work on that was going on contemporaneously. But geologists just looking at the depth of sediments and the rate of sedimentation knew the Earth was hundreds of millions to billions of years old. And this doesn't work that way. And then when you get radioactive dating of rocks and you find out, well, yeah, okay, some of these rocks are many billions of years old, three billion years old, almost four of the oldest rocks on the Earth. It doesn't work. All right. So um, you have to do something else. And the something else you have to do is move into the 20th century. Right. So the two calculations I just showed you were very old, um, 19th century stuff. But now we know that E equals mc squared. We, mass and energy are interconvertible. They're really the same. In fact, you can just ignore the c squared. Everybody gets caught up on the c squared. But that, the c is just a constant. Who cares? It, it has to do with the, number, the kind of units we're using to measure mass and energy. What this says is energy equals mass. I can convert mass directly by any energy. It is energy. That's what e equals mc squared means, right? Um, and Rutherford has said, well, atoms have these massive nuclei, and Cecilia Payne has shown that Sun and other stars are almost all hydrogen. So here's something that's curious. If you, if you know those things and you know this, you, you might be onto something. Um, two protons and two neutrons have more mass than a helium nucleus. Why, is, why do we care? Well, if you don't know what a helium nucleus is, you might not care. But if you're a physicist, you know that a helium nucleus is nothing more then two protons and two neutrons bound into this little particle called an alpha particle. It's an alpha particle. Um, so I put these four things together to make this thing, and this ends up weighing less. It's a great diet plan. <laughs> um, how does that happen? Well, nobody really knew how it happened, but, but now we, we kind of do. Um, what's, what's going on here? is you're converting the difference in mass into energy. So when you, can, when you actually form helium out of hydrogen, you get mc squared, this is the m, of energy out. It turns out that you, you produce, uh, you, you liberate about 0.7% of the mass of these four particles into energy. Not a lot, but a lot more than chemistry does by a factor of a million or so. Okay. The same thing happens in a chemical reaction, but um, Chemical reactions are not as energetic. So this is, you know, this this notion has antecedents as well. Um, Norman Lockyer, years before, had thought, well, you know, maybe the sun's energy is produced when one element is transformed into another. But you know, he didn't even know what atoms were, right? So it was just some kind of a wild, crazy guess. Um, Jean Perron in France, condensation of hydrogen into every element. So this is a little bit later. Um, and he thinks that maybe condensation of hydrogen, he doesn't even know that stars are mostly made of hydrogen yet. But that might do it, right? These are just wild speculations of the type that physicists love to do, even now, even still they do this. Multiverses and such, right? Um, and conversion of four hydrogen atoms to helium would liberate energy, and we just did that calculation. 
I just showed it to you. I just kind of ran over it. Um, so these are all kind of in the right in the right direction, but but they don't know enough yet. The physics isn't there. Right? They don't quite know enough to do this properly. Um, so you have to skip ahead into the 1930s, and you have to start studying nuclei and their reactions. And so one of the things you have to know about um, is that there are these particles called neutrinos, which were sort of postulated to exist by Wolfgang Pauli, who was a German physicist, um, because he noticed that there was some energy and momentum missing from beta decay. Beta decay happens when a proton um, turns into a neutron or vice versa. So you know, a neutron can decay into a proton and an uh, electron, and then there's this, and then you see those, but you don't see anything else, but there needs to be some more energy. And what we know now is there's this other particle called a neutrino, and it's, it's, very, um, it's very low mass. Um, and, and Pauli just assumed that there must be something there to, to, to take away the extra energy and momentum. Fermi called it neutrino because it had to be small. That's the Eno part in Italian, right? The diminutive part. And it had to be neutral. Ne neutrino. Little neutral guy. Um, it was not actually directly detected until 1956, whereas, you know, that's, that's a lot of years. Now we do neutrino physics. We create them and send them through the ground and have detectors that detect them hundreds of miles away. Um, Chadwick, in 1932, a couple of years later, discovered the neutron. Um, Rutherford had already discovered the proton. We knew that those were around, but it turns out you have to have neutrons to hold the nucleus together, too, because the protons are all electrically charged positive, and so they repel. And so you've got these nuclear forces that hold them together at short ranges, but the ones all the way across on the other side of the nucleus, they don't partake in that, right? They only partake, they only partake in that repulsion, that electrical propulsion, which is infinite range. So you need some extra glue, and the neutrons provide that, because they don't have any electrical charge. They only have the little short range, strong forces, so they just hold the thing together. That gets you, that, that works okay for a while, right? But when you get to really big things like uranium, it doesn't, it's not, they're not good enough, and so it still falls apart. Um, 1932, Carl Anderson at Caltech discovered a positron, just like an electron, except it's positively charged. So beta decay can emit either a positron or an electron, and people had noticed these positive electrons for about four or five years prior to this, but, but he was the first one to say, no, this is actually a particle. It's just like an electron that's positively charged. So he gets the credit and the Nobel Prize, by the way. Um, and then um, this notion that nuclear reactions, once you know about them, can power the sun, goes back to George Gamma. Um, there's, a, there's a problem with having nuclear reactions power the sun. And it's what I was alluding to, the, the protons are positively charged, and so they repel very strongly. The electrical force is very, very strong. It's about 10 to the 40th times, 10 to the 4 zero, one of the 40 zeros, times stronger than gravity. So if you shoot two protons at each other, they're likely to go and miss. But if you get them going fast enough, they can get close enough that the nuclear force kicks in, and they'll hold together. Um, the trouble is, if you calculate the likelihood of that happening, it's, it's zero. What Gamow did was show that because of quantum mechanics, that potential energy barrier, the particles don't have to actually overcome it. In quantum mechanics, they can do what's called tunneling through it. There's a finite probability that they don't go over the barrier, they go through it. So there's a finite probability that I want to go in the next room, I just go and I walk through the wall. That's essentially what they're doing. Um, it doesn't work for us, because we're made of lots of particles, so does the wall, and so then the probability even quantum mechanically becomes so small it doesn't ever happen. But for a single particle going against another single particle, it does happen. It can, and it does. So um, that was Gamow's addition, and you have to use quantum mechanics. So all of this stuff relies on this brand new physics, application of brand new physics that did not exist, sometimes even five years before, you know? 1928, well, 1927 is when the Schrodinger equation is published. So within a year, Gamma was putting it to work. Pretty cool, pretty interesting. So at the end of the 1930s, this guy, Hans Bethe, begins to put all this together. And he works out with a colleague, Charles Critchfield, some reactions that can turn protons into helium, hydrogen into helium. Um, 
And uh, this is one, there, there are three possible chains. They're called um, different chains. This is the proton, proton, one chain. You take a couple of protons, you put them together into a deuteron. Then you take another proton, add it to the deuteron. It's, it's shown graphically over here to make helium-3. Then you take two helium-3s, put them together. They spit out an alpha particle, which is a helium nucleus, and two protons plus some energy. Each of these is liberating energy along the way as you go along. Um, but you have to have a high enough temperature to get the protons together in the first place. So you, you, that doesn't just happen in this room. In the center of the sun it happens. The center of the sun is 14 million Kelvin. Um, from what Beta knew, he calculated the center of the sun had to be 16 million Kelvin. So he was pretty close. It wasn't exactly on. Um, and then he also worked out another reaction that, that would go on in other stars. The proton-proton chain goes on in stars like the sun, low mass. But in higher mass stars, you actually have higher temperatures. And so you can slam the proton into big, heavy, much more highly positively charged things like, say, carbon. And you, go, you run through this whole chain of events that involves carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. It's called a CNO cycle. Um, and Beta just worked on it. He was, a, he, was a very, um, he was an expert nuclear physicist. And he just worked on all the possible nuclear reactions that might work. And he threw out the ones that wouldn't, and these are the ones that were left. Um, so he has this prediction, basically. If you look at the CNO cycle, some of these things go really fast, fraction of a second. Some of them take years. And so the really fast ones, those reactants, the things on the right side, they get taken out. And you don't expect to see very many of them if this is going on in stars. But the ones that are very slow, you know, if this, if this steps really fast, which I can't remember which ones are the fast and the slow, but anyway, um, and this one's really slow, then, then stuff's going to pile up right here. And you would expect to see a lot of carbon-13, and you don't. So this one must be fast, and this one must be slow, right? Because this is the nitrogen that you see a lot of. Um, so this makes a prediction based on the rates of these reactions as to the relative amounts of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen of various isotopes. And you can go and look at those ratios by using stellar spectroscopy to measure it. And guess what? You get exactly what this predicts. So Beta was right. right? By throwing out what doesn't work and keeping only what does, he actually made a theory that predicted what was going on. Um, so he was, he was co corroborated in this. Now, beta could not get beyond helium. Both CNO is just, it's, it's basically creating helium here, right? It's, it's a type of hydrogen burning. It catalyzes carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, but it doesn't use them up. Um, and it, and it, the net result is you turn four protons into a helium nucleus. He couldn't get beyond that. The reason is because there's no stable nucleus with a mass of five, six, seven, or eight that is stable within stars. So there's a roadblock. You can't just keep adding protons because the nuclei that you create fall apart. As fast as you make them, they fall apart. So how do you make the heavier stuff? Um, in 1951, there was a postulate by Edwin Selpeter and Ernst Opik, um, independently, not working together, working independently, that said, well, maybe you can take four helium get them all in the same spot at one time and make carbon out of that. And that's called the triple alpha process because it takes three alpha particles and creates a carbon. And then you jump over that gap that you can't otherwise get over. So this is what's happening um, in some stars. It's a very unlikely process because it's hard to get three particles all the same place at the same time, right? I mean, you're going to get two, you make beryllium, beryllium's going to fall apart really fast. So you've got to hit it with another helium um, before it falls apart. And that's an unlikely thing. It's a very inefficient process, but that is the only thing we know of that can power stars beyond hydrogen. Um, the sun is still burning hydrogen. In about five billion years, it will switch over to this. And we do see some stars that are doing, that are doing, that are helium burning. It, it doesn't last very long. What about the rest of the stuff? Um, it is the stars, the stars above us govern our conditions. This is from King Lear. And it's the opening to a paper from 1957 that describes where all the rest of the stuff comes from. And this paper was by uh, Fred Hoyle, Willie Fowler, Margaret, and Jeff Burbage. And what they did, and it took them a long time, they started working on this in 1953, the paper was published in 1957. They tried to figure out where all the other elements come from. And this is called the curve of binding energy. And it shows the binding energy per nucleus of, of atoms. The higher the binding energy, the more stable the nucleus. Hydrogen has no binding energy because it's just a proton. There's nothing to bind to. Helium-4 is way up here. It has a lot of binding energy. So you release a lot of energy when you go from hydrogen to helium. 
These have lower binding energy, so you don't really go the other way. That's kind of what I was just talking about. But if you can get beyond helium to carbon, then you can start adding alpha particles to make things like oxygen and magnesium, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so this paper describes how that happens. And here are a couple of reactions by which it might. And you get energy out every time you go to one of these more tightly bound nuclei, all the way to iron. You stop at iron from this process. Now, you can also add protons into these. And, and depending on exactly what nucleus you're making, you, you may or may not be able to do it. Um, the ones out here, you have to make in different ways. So those ones, if you add an alpha particle, you go to lower energy. That's not going to happen. But what you can do is you can add a neutron, and you can make a slightly heavier element. And you can keep adding neutrons. And most of those elements are going to be radioactive. They'll decay. But they may decay to something stable. So sometimes you just add neutrons and you, you pile, you know, you, you keep pushing the mass out this way, and then it decays to something stable and you've made that element. And so they worked out all those reactions too in this paper. Burbage, Burbage, Fowler, and Hoyle. It's called B squared FH. Every astrophysicist knows that and has read it. They made me read it when I was a first year graduate student or something. Um, I should say that Alistair Cameron also came up with the same thing independently in Canada. So this is how we think um, most of the other elements are, well, all, essentially all the other elements are made. Sometimes to get out here, you can't just have slow neutrons trickling out of the, out of the core from nuclear burning. It has to happen in a special event called a supernova, where the core collapses to basically neutrons. You make a tremendous <coughs> number of neutrons that go out through the star. And that's called, so there's a slow process that I described first, and then there's the rapid process in a supernova, and you can make really, the really heavy ones out here that way. Now, if this is all true, this fairy tale, you should be able to see it in abundances. And in fact, you do. So this is a plot of abundances of elements, all the elements. And see it has this seesaw? <clears throat> the ones at the top, the ones that are very abundant, well, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And the abundances are as predicted by beta's CNO cycle. But then as you go on, the ones that are abundant are the ones that you just take one of these and you just add an alpha particle. And then you add another alpha particle. Then you add another alpha particle. Then you add another alpha particle. And you keep doing that. Iron's very abundant because it has the most strongly bound nucleus. So this is where that alpha particle at a time stops. Then these are, um, are the, the neutron capture ones. And the seesaw here is just, if you have a nucleus that has an, odd no or an even number of protons and an even number of neutrons, it's more stable than when it has an odd odd or an odd even because of pairing. When you have two protons paired in the nucleus, it has a lower energy than a single proton by itself in the nucleus. And the same with neutrons. So that's what you're seeing here. Now, all of this stuff tells you how you get um, all the heavy elements. And it tells you how you get some helium, but most of the helium doesn't come this way. It comes right out of the Big Bang, and I haven't talked about that. So the hydrogen and the helium come out of the Big Bang. The stars have added a little helium, but almost nothing. And most of it's locked up inside the stars, then it gets burned into other elements anyway. So to summarize, um, what I hope is you've taken from this talk is that science is collaborative. Um, figuring out this problem, where the elements came, come from, took thousands of people. I've mentioned a few. I've, I've left out many, many, many. I've, I've tried to hit some of the highlight ones, well, I hit the highlight ones, and some of the lesser known important ones. Um, basic research, none of these people was doing anything applied. They were just trying to figure out how things work. Sometimes they weren't trying to figure out where elements come from at all. But that's where it led. Um, so when you do basic research, you can find out some unexpected things, and sometimes they're interesting things. Um, there were pivotal moments, and I want to stress pivotal moments not pivotal people. Because one of the things I've also tried to show is in many of these cases, we, I told you the person who gets the credit, but then I mentioned, oh, and this other person did it independently over here at the same time. Because once it becomes possible to know something because of something that somebody else somewhere else did, and that gets around, smart people can put that together and come up with something new. So we often talk about um, you know, these, these these great men of science who, who have vision beyond. And um, that's not necessarily true. One person gets the credit, 
but other people could do it. That's true of special relativity, not general, but special. And then the great men of science are sometimes women. And that's something that gets overlooked. Less, less so now, less, less than in the past, hopefully. Um, and then be really careful about saying what can never be possible. <laughs> so um, just looking to the future a little bit, and then I'll be done. A hundred years ago, scientists thought that they had made most of the discoveries there were to be made. They could describe almost everything in the world, so they thought, and there were just a few details um, to be ironed out. And in ironing out those details, one of them was the black body radiation, one was this sort of curious um, electrodynamical behavior of magnets and coils. Um, one led to quantum mechanics, and the other led to relativity, which completely changed our view of the world, utterly completely shattered the old world, didn't destroy it. The old physics is still valid in its in its realm of applicability, but there's this whole rich riches to the world that it can't describe that we now are able to. So if we look at now, scientists believe that almost within reach we have a complete theory of subatomic particles. It's called the standard model. We're just looking for this one little thing called the Higgs boson. And that's what the LHC is busily doing right now as we speak, trying to tease out the Higgs boson. And um, cosmologists, same thing. We got this really good theory of cosmology, and it describes the large scale structure, and it describes the Big Bang origin, and the, the, how the elements were formed as I've just gone through, how much hydrogen and helium there is. But there are these two little things <laughs> dark energy and dark matter, which I'm not talking about. Um, so maybe we're going to have another revolution. Maybe that's what it's going to take to understand this stuff is a, a paradigm shift, a new way of looking at things. Who knows? I don't know. But anyway, thanks. Speculate, if you would, about what that new revolution might look like. Oh, well, you know, you, you, you're ignoring my, uh, well, I guess I said what's never going to be possible, not well, what is going to be possible. Speculate. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't. I can't, I can't. I mean, there are some people, I'm not a theoretician, I'm an observer, so we're, you know, we try and keep our feet on the ground more. Um, you have to come to a talk by a theoretician and they will talk your ear off about what they're going to speculate on. Um, yeah, the, the things I talk to my friends about who do this and, and that I read about, um, there are alternate theories of gravity that have to do with higher dimensions and brains, you know, string theory stuff. Some people think that's where it's going to go. Maybe they're right. But I would say that at the moment, those ideas are kind of like the ideas in 1870 about stars being powered by conversion of one element into another. I mean, it's kind of a curious thing that somebody thought that in 1870, but didn't know what atoms were, didn't know what nuclei were, nuclei were, didn't know anything that you would need to know to actually make a meaningful statement like that. And I, you know, I think we're kind of in that, in that same regime right now. I was wondering about the elements beyond uranium that have been produced only in the laboratory, and they're unstable, I think, right? And are they ever produced outside? Of, and are they produced in stars, or they just sure, they hang around? Sure, more? probably. Um, I mean, some of them have really long half-lives. Plutonium has a pretty long half-life, so you could imagine that it might be produced, but it's just such a a minuscule uh, amount that would be produced that you don't you don't see it, um, but I, you know I can't think of any reason why it absolutely cannot be produced. And some of them, you know, even in the laboratory, they last for a fraction of a second and they're gone. So I mean, that would say that you're not going to produce them in nature. I mean, maybe for a fraction of a second. What's on the screen? Oh, what's on the screen is a, a, a nearby radio galaxy, active galaxy. Um, it's a composite image. So what you have is right in here in the center a supermassive black hole that is devouring material um, and shooting out these jets, relativistic jets often. Um, so some appreciable fraction of the speed of light. Um, and this is what it looks like in the optical. And this is the radio and this is an x-ray picture well, with some of the optical put on top of it as well. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff that my telescope monitors uh, to try and see when they're doing something interesting in the optical, and then they go look at them with gamma-ray telescopes and x-ray telescopes. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. I read about the precursors of DNA being in outer space. Do you know anything about that? Well, that's that biology stuff again. <laughs> <laughs> but you must know. Yeah, so precursors. Well, I know a little bit about some of that. Um, there are lots of complex molecules that are detected in, in outer space through their radio emission lines. Um, some of those are amino acids. And all of the amino acids, I think there are 20 that people are made of, that life on Earth is made of. Um, but there are many more kinds of amino acids as well. And, and so all 20 have been found in space in molecular clouds as, as well as others. The um, complete amino acid? Yeah. Uh, we can't hear her. She said, so she was asking um, precursors of DNA in space. And uh, now, there have been other complex um, organic molecules like formaldehyde, and there's, there's a list, there are hundreds, I can't remember them all, that have also been detected. Now, by precursor of DNA, um, my understanding of DNA is that you have these phosphorus bases and and I can't remember what's in the middle of the little, I don't know exactly what the chemistry is, so I, I don't so know. Phosphate, uh, uh, phosphate sugar chain, I think. Sugar, yeah, that and sounds familiar. Before, uh, adenine and yeah, so we have adenine and then blah, blah. Has that been detected? I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that com complex uh, molecules, organic molecules, have been. So, you know, the right stuff is out there, but I don't know how close it gets to being an actual DNA. You'd have to ask uh, a radio astronomer. They could probably tell me better. Yeah. I teach first grade. Okay. So I, I'm bringing this all down to a seven, six, seven, eight-year-old level. Okay. I teach a, a simple thing about the Earth and the seasons and time. Yeah. And the kids always are fascinated with the sun mm -hmm. because it's it, they feel it, they see it. Yeah, it's an impressive thing, isn't it? Very impressive. <laughs> For us, anyway. And the hardest thing to explain to them is what the sun is okay. and what it does. Okay. What would, you, what would you recommend that I tell young children about what the sun is, what it does, how come it's doing what it's doing? It's a big nuclear reactor. It's okay. a big ball of hydrogen mm -hmm. gas, and it has nuclear reactions going on in it. Um, different than nuclear reactors, fission reactors. It's a fusion reactor. And it's, it's taking the simplest elements, hydrogen and helium, and converting them into the more complex elements, including the ones that we're made of. That's what it's doing. Is it feasible to tell them it's a big rock that's burning? It's not a rock, Sorry. and not it's not burning. Okay. And it's not burning. It's absolutely not a rock. Right? It's a big ball of hydrogen gas. And, um, Does sun have substance? It's, it's gas. So it, it has substance similar to you know, the air in this room having substance. But um, you know, the center of the sun, the densest part, has a density about 100 times the density of water. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the densest part. So it's still a gas. Okay. Um, it, is, it is not a solid by any stretch. Okay. Um, it's a big ball of gas that's very hot and undergoing nuclear reactions in the center, just in the center. Okay. Like the gas giants. Gas giants are, are the same. They're undergoing nuclear reactions in the center. They're much, much, much hotter. Yeah. Lower, lower density um, on average, but much higher temperature in the center. You call it the sun the plasma? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's plasma. Four, four. Yeah, ionized gas. Yeah. But, you know, first graders, I wouldn't go to plasma. I'd just say gas. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't go with plasma there either. Go gas. <laughs> and why doesn't this gas dissipate? Why, why Gravity. Gravity. Gravity holds it? Same as our atmosphere. Why doesn't our atmosphere just boil off into space? The gravity holds it on Mars. The gravity is not strong enough. So it, in fact, did boil off into space, and Mars has almost no atmosphere. Um, the moon is so small that it can't hold an atmosphere at all, so there's no atmosphere there. Okay, just, so just gravity. We, so we've got, it's pulling on itself. Yeah. I, I'm just trying to put this into seven-year-old words. No, no, that's, that's uh, gravity. It's just gravity. It's every bit of the sun gravitationally bound to every other bit. That's the same thing that holds the Earth together. Yeah. You know, if you turned off gravity, there's a lot of pressure in the Earth, and it would explode. So um, it's the gravity that holds holds all these objects together, whether they're solids or gases or whatever. Okay. Do you do this often? Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> you? 
<laughs> not to first graders, no, it's hard to explain things to first graders that are in the physics world. <laughs> well, okay, I hope you learned something from that anyway. That was, that was Thank interesting. You. I did. There's a lot of questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.